Broadcasting live from the elegant parlor on the plain of Ravnica, this is Tap Tap Concede. Welcome everybody to Tap Tap Concede. My name is Graham and joining me is Cameron hmm? and Kathleen ah. <laughs> with James on tech. Thank you, James. And uh, a reminder before we begin that this show is brought to you by Card Kingdom. Please check out cardkingdom.com slash LRR soon, if not already. Actually, I think already you can pre-order Fallout. Which Ooh. I'm personally very invested in, <laughs> but you can pre-order the uh, Fallout Commander decks and Collector Boosties and all that fun stuff. Or, you know, we are still within Murders at Karlov Banner. It's at time of recording, comes it, out today. Yeah, it's release day. I was, I was about to say. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Especially the next thing and the first thing has even come out. Yeah. So, you know, get yourself some Murders at Karlov Banner. Why not? And get yourself a f- little funny button that says funny things by telling them, Loading Radio Run sent me. Button, please. I believe we are still experiencing uh, live... Or life, laughter, land drops. Hmm. That's really all we can hope for. <laughs> also, this show and everything we do is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Thank you so much for continuing to let us do all the things that we do, such as answering your questions. It's the mailbag. Woohoo! Whee! James put out the call on some manner of the social medias. Two different kinds? No, just Twitter this time. Oh, all right, well. I didn't have, I couldn't get into the Blur MTG t- t- Mastodon. Oh, I'll help you out with that. Yeah. Um, maybe next time. But for now, uh, these are some questions that James received and pared down to a manageable list to answer within the time limit of a podcast. <laughs> so first, let's begin with a question from Cowboy Kyle. Bears, black, and aristocrats are generally considered your favorite archetypes, even if for a meme. What are the next one or two things that you love playing in Magic? I love that it's like bears for me, aristocrats for Cameron. Kathleen's just black. Yeah, well, it's the best color. Mm -hmm. Uh, But other colors I enjoy are (laughs) white. Honestly, okay, if we're going to talk about things that I like, I like goofy, like doing things decks where it's like ah i do this and then that happens and then this happens and then that happens and i like twiddling <laughs> like there's you know just that's the card that comes to mind but just like i don't know i like i like feeling like a mad genius and i've like revved up the lawnmower and it's a somewhere in the distance yeah raymond scott's powerhouse is playing yeah exactly da, 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 i like da, 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 da. i like trying to make interesting things happen but that, those decks you really have to know what's in the deck to make that happen so it feels mm. even feel even cleverer um but yeah i don't know what else do i like playing in limited mid-range i guess yeah yeah i'm not very exciting um the 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 decks besides like aristocrats are fun mm-hmm. they're interesting they're I, synergetic i quite um, like playing aristocrats yeah decks. It's, it's a great archetype yeah uh thank you what was his name the guy who kind of in, didn't invent the archetype, but really popularized it in, in a Strad block. Oh, uh, is it Tom Martell? Oh, yeah, Tom Martell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we salute you. Mm-hmm. Um, but lately, I've really just enjoyed the usually green centered decks where you just like, you play a threat and you don't necessarily protect it, but you use it to apply. The green strategy of lowering a shipping container of value on your opponent very, very slowly, yeah. which I think Alex, that was his formulation of it, mm-hmm. right? Where it was kind of like the siege rhino strategy, right. but the thing where you resolve like kind of a big dork and then you use fight cards to keep the board clear and you just never let your opponent come up for air. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess what I'm talking about is just the strategy where you rain two for ones upon the smaller opponent. Yeah. Value. Yeah. Um, I do. As, yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds like, as it turns out, I like winning, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how else to structure that. Yeah. Um, I also like storming out because, oh, yeah. you know, if you're not going, if you don't bother to learn the format, don't interact. <laughs> I mean, I do. Yeah. I do kind of like sometimes being the bad guy and going like, no, no, I'm, I only, I get to play magic this game. And just sort of like, nope, you bounce that, counter that. No, no, I only my stuff gets to do things. Um, but I think more than that, uh, I enjoy. Uh, I just keep coming back to the t- the teamer big spells deck from Strixhaven Limited, 
<sighs> where you got your you got your field trip and which is the three mana you go looking for a you ramp yourself and you learn and then your environmental sciences and and you're just sort of like you're 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 just sort of like shoring up with prismari pledge mages the three three for two mm-hmm. and uh you know like your opponent's wailing on you with strixhaven flyers or whatever and then eventually eventually you're just like a uh, seven mana spell seven mana spell eight mana spell uh on turn like six or something and it, it's i don't it's it's fun it's very fun all p- possibly because it keeps working <laughs> <laughs> that that might be. I'm the opponent the wailing reason. on you with uh, Silver Quill Flyers. The Silver Quill deck is also super fun. The Silver Quill deck, everybody was like, eh, it's not very good compared to all these other decks. And then it's like, well, hold up, while while everybody else is messing around, we're just going to take all of these cards that are super aggressive, and I'm just going to punch you with something that either gets Life Link or Flying, mm-hmm. depending on how I'm feeling. Any other format, and the Golgari Life Gain deck in that in in that set would have been my jam mm. but for some reason there's only two silver there's only two strixhaven decks that i like and uh, there's two colors in one of them and the three colors in the other and that's it <laughs> there's no crossover mm. oh another deck that i also really liked was in highlander there was an archetype that was referred to like it was marginal but it was mono grixis two for ones oh yeah and it was just kind of like this <laughs> tap out value deck where every turn you just like tapped out all your mana and then were like i don't know some kind of like uh 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 hypnotic specter equivalent Mm. right that just like you know you had to discard cards and then it was a threat or you had to like i don't know it 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 was good it felt good it was kind of like it was a kind of a three-head deck highlander has the best deck names of any format yeah You, you can't like yeah Mono Grixis two. Mono for ones. two for ones is one of my favorites. If you've never resolved an electrolyze at sorcery speed, <laughs> I I just really recommend it. It's yeah. The most recent North One Hundred Showdown has Wheeler piloting a deck. He's called Selesnia Idiots, mm. mm-hmm. and I'm a big fan. Nice, nice. Yeah. All right, next question. Is our favorite. Archetype from, Himbos? Might be. <laughs> might be, From yeah. Goban asks, is there a specific card that you own or have owned in your collection that holds a special place in your heart? Mm. Oh, gosh, probably. Okay, hold up. All right. I can think of some. So. Lay it on me. Now, the <laughs> earlier, this is your early collection things. Uh-huh. But there's a card in... I don't even think it's in the version of this deck anymore, but it was in a very early version of my black, my very first commander deck, which was blue, black fairies. And there's, there's a card called Helm of the Ghast Lord. Oh, wow. And I just enjoyed playing with it because you could put it on any fairy Mm -hmm. and do revolting things to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it was just really fun. And yeah, it's like a four mana common enchantment, but I always just really enjoyed resolving and playing that. So I would say, I don't... I guess it's. I guess this card is one of my lads. I suppose to use. One of your, oh, one of your boys. One of my boys to <laughs> yeah, use the wrestling from, terms from, from OSW. But yeah, this is not. This pat- is in your boys' stable. Yeah, this is my boys. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is not particularly like. I guess I don't know. I just have good. F- that was the first thing that came to mind is fuzzy feelings about putting this on some creature and then just ruining people's day with it. For those for those listening, Helm of the Ghast Lord is three and a hybrid Demir. So four mana in blue or black. It's a creature enchantment. And then as long as the creature is blue, it gets plus one, plus one. And whenever this deals damage to an opponent, draw a card. And if it's black, it gets plus one, plus one. And whenever it deals damage to an opponent, that player discards a card. So on your little one, one blue, black fairy rogue tokens, this makes them into three threes that draw a card and make them discard. Correct. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I dig it. Also, it's a good name. Helm yeah. of the Ghast Lord. Ghast There's Lord. also Ghast Lord of the Fuge, which is like a creature that like does that or whatever it is. Like I, I think I assume this is his hat. Yeah, this is his hat. Um, and yeah, Ghast Lord of the Fugue. Uh, and then yeah, when it deals combat damage to a player, uh, you get a card and mm. from their hand, and that's really gross. But I feel like the helm is actually just way better. He is a ghost that has never known life. That is a cool bit of flavor text. That's super metal. Yeah, that is metal. <laughs> That's yeah. good stuff. 
Um, I remember that fairy's deck. That was a lot of fun. Hmm. Um, what? Gosh, I have a Sigarda, <gasps> uh, host of herons. Yes. That is the commander, currently the commander for the first commander deck I ever built. The first commander deck I ever built was actually Reese the Redeemed. And, but not using Reese to do any of the stuff that Reese is good for. It's, I figured it's just that he was cheap. I was like, I like white green. So I went on Gatherer because it was the only option at the time and looked for all the cards that were white and green and was just like, great, I'll order all of these from Card Kingdom and I'll put them in a deck. Hmm. And it turns out that uh, irresponsible amounts of life gain is a viable strategy. Um, I remember playing against, um, Oh God! Who was in this pod? I think John Lux was in this pod. I played against. I played a four-player commander game at Card Kingdom one day that I I won the game at two hundred and fifty-two life or something. <laughs> it was it was a silly silly thing. Like, and and that's legitimately gained life. This is not like oh a, yeah some kind of yeah. Oh, there's no like there's no big combos. This is just like uh, locks it on Warhammer and you know the like Oracle of whatever it is that you tap x to just gain life it was right yeah um eventually it was like okay i'm not doing the token stuff with reese so like really reese is just here to be a white green commander so why don't i get a commander that does stuff and um so i have a sigarda host of herons or herons grace no i think it is it herons grace i think it's the other one there's a couple sigardas um i think it's i swear it was the that one that one yeah yeah host of herons from avison restored uh, and specifically, I think you had arranged to get me a art altar of that one uh, from Marshall. Yeah. Because Marshall, among the, his many Renaissance talents, mm -hmm. uh, is doing... He hasn't done these in years, I don't think, but he used to do like full art extensions of cards. And so I have a altar of Sigarda that uh, Marshall did, which I mm. is uh, and that you gave me. So I, I quite like that one. Um, for a long time, I guess my, like, not pet card, but the card that I had most attachment to is probably my revised Soul Ring, which I had had since I was, like, oh, yeah. 13. Um, and recently I, I went through my collection and realized I don't play with a lot of these cards, and I got rid of it mm. in a kind of, you know, kill your darlings um, effort. Mm. And since then, I've tried not to be sentimental about cards. I think that's a healthy attitude to take for what it's yeah. worth. Yeah. Um, I had like a foil uh, hedron crab oh. that I loved very much. A little tinkering with the hedron. Yeah. Um, and got rid of that as well. And I don't know. Uh, feels good? Yeah, feels good, nice. I think. And if I want them back, I can probably find copies. Mm -hmm. They're they they aren't the ones that I had, but they're they're pretty fungible. Yeah. Right. Um, extremely fungible tokens. Extremely fungible <laughs> tokens. Putting the fun in fungible. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All and right. hopefully no longer putting the fung in fungible. <laughs> fung. I think I could think of a lot of like pet cards from like recent draft formats that I'm like, oh, I love that little guy, mm -hmm. right? But like, I feel like that's what I feel for like. A card I felt an instant emotional kinship to, nice. which I think was that answer there, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next question from Justin G says, in general, <laughs> you're gonna, you're not going to love the answer to this. How many commander decks do each of you tend to keep built at a time? And why, at what point do you dismantle a deck you've built? Here's the, here's the hard truth about being Magic the Gathering content creators is that I rarely get a chance to play a lot of Magic the Gathering outside of the content for Magic the Gathering. Um I have I have a bunch of commander decks that I built ages ago and I haven't dismantled and they're sort of sitting in a drawer. Uh, so I don't know, like I guess like seven or eight, but like I'm not adding to them and I'm not, I'm not cycling through. I keep buying secret layers because I'm like, oh, I could use these in commander decks. And then mm -hmm. I'm like... A huge collection of This stuff. is why when we did that mono white commander night and um, I got the... I didn't... I didn't brew the list, but I was like, ooh, I can put all my secrets. This is why there were so many goofy secret layer cards in there. Because I was like, I can finally use all this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't I do not do a lot of commander brewing, mostly because of time, not because of enjoyment of doing it. Mm. I have one. 
I have my um, uh, Ramirez Di Pietro deck. Yeah. Which is just kind of like a hobby deck. I have it. I'll take cards out. I'll put new cards in when I feel like something has gotten an upgrade. And otherwise, it's just kind of what I I keep to tinker around with. It's like, I hesitate to use the word like hot rod project mm. because that implies some kind of proficiency in the deck mm-hmm. uh, when really it's more just to kind of like dirtle around and be able to show up to a putative commander night with something that oh, yeah. is mine. Um, but yeah, I, I only really have the one. For a while I was tinkering around with, oh, what's her name? She's the Rakdos commander, the Madness commander. Uh, As Miranda Mordecai. No, no, no. She, car? She's the food commander. Oh. Uh, you tap her to draw Anya cards. Anya Falconrath. Yeah, Anya Falconrath. And uh, I, I put in a bunch of like what I thought were interesting Madness cards. And then I also had like a backup win the game project, which was a doomsday stack <laughs> and then i played with it a couple of times and realized hey this sucks <laughs> like usually when you god hand with a deck yeah it should feel good yeah instead of just being like oh okay well this tap uh doomsday <laughs> uh, and i win yeah i win oh okay yeah Let's play again. Then you don't draw the god hand. You're like, wait, my deck does nothing. Yeah, it does nothing, yeah. right? Like, Anya was such a cool concept for a commander that just does not quite have the support yet to do interesting things. Mm. And all of the good things you can do with her just kind of suck. Mm. Mm. If she was blue, if she mm. had blue in her identity, I think that would like be a lot better. I have a bunch of commander decks, but I have one because, like, I don't want to bring a bunch of commander decks if we go to, like, an event. I just want to be able to play commander. So I have, yeah. and when they put out the pre con, I used to just bring a pre con, but they put out the fairy pre con for Wilds Veldrain. Love fairies talked mm-hmm. about how much I was like, ooh, I can take this new fairy deck that's got lots of good stuff in it, and I can put in all of the good stuff from my old fairy deck, which is also like objectively bad now by today's standards of the game. And I can make a really pretty decent fairy deck. And so that is my current, I guess, hot rod project is I'm going to just play that and eventually get it into some sort of like orbital killing laser state and then retire it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I have, I have the, that Selesnian deck that I mentioned, my tree folk deck that I've, talked about a bunch i have the i have a a variant now i think of the what i call the janky ballard deck which was like Mm. madness madness discard that kind of thing um and i have a couple that i built for streams that are like the strixhaven box mander deck that i was just like this is just a fun deck i'm just going to kind of keep this together as like a Mm. like an artifact of that um i don't this is this is funny i don't actually have my own copy of Bear Force One, hmm. uh, or or two, because the way that Game Nights operates is they're like, no, no. Card Kingdom sends us the cards; we will keep the cards here. Presumably because they've had bad experience of someone being like, oh, I I forgot my deck, or like, whoops, I guess I've missed a couple cards. They prefer to just be like, we know that if anything goes wrong with the deck, it's it's that it's on us, right? Hmm. So they're like, don't build the deck; we will build the deck; it will be here. Uh, for you when you arrive and it will stay here when you leave. So I haven't actually built my own copy to have and I really should because I have a couple really nice copies of Ayula that people have given me and that I'm like... you do have the deck list. I've got the yeah. list. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I know what the cards are. It's just... Although I have to find... i got to find my own Henge. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Tell you, Henges these days, they run into dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? They're pretty great. <laughs> Everyone loves a good Henge. Oh, and someday I'll finish my Minotaur deck. I have like most of a Minotaur deck together with Mogus, God of Slaughter, as the commander, who's not creature type Minotaur, but is one. Like just from looking at Mogus, it's like, oh, that's it's a Minotaur, obviously, um, and is in the right colors for it. And then I have all the all the Minotaur. It's in the same vein as the Tree Folk deck, and it's like all the good Minotaurs, excellent. All the like reasonable Minotaurs, yep, you're in too. All the bad Minotaurs, guess what? You're in here also. Didgeridoo, Windmill Slam. Everything else is... <laughs> Everyone yeah. in the pool. Exactly, yep. yeah. It's uh, it's 
<laughs> I don't think it's going to be good, but one of these days I'll 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 trot that one out. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that to Minotaurs. Next <laughs> question from Chris RD19 says, "What do you think the magic story needs to really break out and be more popular than it is?" Time and space. <laughs> Time and space. Yeah. Uh man, I whenever I read the magic story, I'm like, this would be great if it had 200 more pages to breathe. Mhm. Uh like I love short fiction. I love short fiction. Flannery O'Connor, uh, 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 Borges, um, uh, uh, Nabokov. Hell yeah, love me short fiction. Um, give me like novels again. Like this is something Games Workshop actually does really well. Is that they're just like, yeah, we've got a publishing arm for our company. We will just turn out. Like paperbacks, we'll make pulp paperbacks. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're they're the... cheap, and like we've got this stable of authors who are good at their job, and you know, like that they're fun reads. You read them on the can, and uh, or you listen to the audiobook, and they establish like depth and character of the world, and give you ideas for thing ways to interact with the game. And from a, from a slightly different perspective. Also, uh, I think that they really need to, I don't know what internal processes they need to solve to make this happen, but to like get better about reflecting stuff on the cards. And I'm thinking specifically, I'm not going to say anything outside of an NDA here, but I'm thinking specifically of Murders at Karlov Manor. And I was looking at stuff the other day and sort of uh, remembering what it was like working on the set and looking at the world guide because you have to know if you're working on the creative text, you know the world guide and the setting and the story and the all the players involved and all that. And uh, there's so much there that's just not in the set. It's like, it's in the set, but it's not clear. It's not reflected in the set. Just like some stuff about the agency, right? Like, and and like how it operates and stuff. And it's like, they have answers for a ton of different things. Like what, what, what a barrier ward is and how it works or where the agencies operated and how long they've been around and all well, this I mean, stuff. Some and of that's addressed in the fiction, but I you know could put even more of it in there. That's what I'm saying. More space. Most people to get, I think to get the magic story more successful, you need to make the, pl the players who only have the cards to look at more interested in s seeing like the stories are great. I want to see more of it reflected on the cards. Mm-hmm. I feel like part of the part of what they've been trying to do is simplify the story a little bit. Yeah, you More know. Of, I should say, I'm sorry, because there's lots of story spotlight cards. There are in this set. The plot of the story of murders at Karlov Manor is is reflected on yeah, the cards. More of the world building is not. I want to see more of that. That's fair. I want to look at the cards and be like, I wish to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> and then go and read the the stories. I have read the stories because of <laughs> all of this, um, but I I, mean, I feel like many people have not. I feel like people are more interested in the murders at Karlov Manor story than the like people. I don't know. Like I feel like they're some of the best written ones in a while. Yeah, there there's definitely a lot of stuff going on that is in the story and is reflected and i think that yeah you can look at the and this is a huge improvement over how it used to be right you can look at the cards and you know what happened in the story because they have the story spotlight that literally includes like bits from the fiction and stuff like that so i think they've been really working to push that into that you can just look at the cards and pick up the broad strokes of what is happening and if you want to read the story there's even a lot more right like, you know, you can see Tesa being murdered and then you see her coming back and stuff like that. And you see like Oba being like detained and all of like the big story spotlight beats from the story. So I think, you know, and they've also like, I don't think it's on, I don't think there's, I don't think it's an accident that we're following a new character as he journeys through the multiverse, uh, discovering things to sort of cut off all of this like ancient history of characters that it's hard to know about and get into from like, if you're a brand new player and stuff like that. And they've tried to like simplify going forward and like, you know, put in a fresh perspective. So I think they're really trying to like scale the size of stories they're trying to tell back and to make it so the stories they are telling are apparent on the cards. But I think, to Cameron's point, I think 
they need to like accept that like the caring about the story of a tabletop game puts you into fairly nerdy territory and just embrace that yeah and just say hey if you like to go deep on things, that's here for you. Because the thing is, people do like to go deep on things. People like to go deep on Warhammer lore. People like to go deep on like niche TV shows and stuff like that. They People like stories, right? Mm -hmm. They like learning about things. And if they have talented people in the building making really cool, interesting worlds and stories, just put more of that detail out there. And But like, you know, it's hard to... Games Workshop has been building this up for years, so they know that they can make at least a, 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 a smidge of profit on these books. Like, ludicrous amounts, actually, right? Like, um, when we went back and did Brothers War, mm -hmm. right, this was examining, like, this kind of foundational uh, mythological event in mm -hmm. Magic's history. Yeah. Right? Um, imagine if instead of, like, a 10-part, um, like, get on. <laughs> narrative, like... Sequential story mm -hmm. with a bunch of like related, like peripheral stories mm -hmm. around it, which is how I kind of remember that. Yeah. Right. You had Teferi looking for the Silex, and then you also had like a bunch of like other side stories occurring around it. Mm -hmm. um, what Games Workshop did in a similar situation was they wrote 60 novels <laughs> over a course of 20 years. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Which is, so it's, it's probably too many, uh, but some of them were quite good. Like there were there were six or seven like legit bangers in there, um, right? With like quite interesting character development, and what the effect is is that it brings in people who don't necessarily care that much about playing the game, or when people want to take breaks from the game, they can remain kind of like in the orbit of mm. the community. Right, because the like the Warhammer community is very much about the lore. Yeah, well, it's that's a cool idea. There, there's like twelve entry point Games Workshop. Like it's 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 a cynical way of looking at it, right? But this is like in the classic definition of the word, it's it, it's hack fiction, right? You take a paycheck yeah. to write a thing for. But I, sometimes hack fiction is fun to read. I don't. Yeah, think we no, should... yeah, it, it, it's it's yeah. not a pejorative term. I'm using it in like the classical thing where you're okay. taking like a paycheck to write about yeah like somebody else's stuff. Um, and like, it's a, it's a bit cynical of me to say it in this way, but like, it, 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 it gives it many entry points into your IP. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it does. Yeah. Like, I think, and I think part of the reason that Magic is, or like Hasbro is like, hey, can we have a Netflix licensing division or whatever it was mm -hmm. that ended up costing them like a billion dollars or something like that was because they're like, look, uh, at television adaptions really can be entrances into the IP, like Penelope uh, has watched My Little Pony and bought ponies and bought pony books at used bookstores and all mm -hmm. sorts of things. Like, and... You know, she's into that IP because, you know, the TV. And so, like, you know, can we have a bad, uh, can we have an adaption of magic? It's like, well, maybe. I don't know. I think it's probably cheaper to write books, but. Mm -hmm. uh. And it, it, it just requires kind of like an investment into it. Yep. Right? Like when the, the first, I remember when the first Gaunt's Ghost book came out, which was like, uh, a Warhammer 40k novel series that now has like I think 16 novels in it. Whoa! Mm -hmm. But it's just about like normal human soldiers in the 41st millennium. And reading it, you go back to it now and think, "Wow, he tried to cram everything into this, right? Like, there's a little bit of everything in this book, probably because the author didn't think there was going to be another one, mm. <laughs> right. right? Like, it was. It's very clearly like. Um, I don't know. I, I want to call it a juvenile work in that it's got to have like everything in it. You know, when you're, you're right. when you're yeah. young and you're writing your first kind of thing. Yeah, it's got to have. You know, this is my bucket list of things to put in a book. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's cool, right? But it feels a bit all over the place, and it's clearly that way because like maybe there's not going to be another one. Maybe this is just all there's going to be, and it's going to tank, and it's not going to work. Right. And you know that author has gone on to write, God, like sixty books for them, hmm. and. You know, it's nice work if you can get it. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. All right. 
Space and time. So cop from what um, Games Workshop is doing is our answer there. Is like, do what in they're doing. In this specific instance. Yeah. yeah. Because they're doing a great job engaging people in the lore of their product, which is no more accessible than magic lore and story. I would say it's actually probably far less accessible. Yeah. Well, yeah, and they, they also had a guy whose entire job was was just to like manage the filing cabinets full of canon. And whose like job description was when one of the authors was like, "Have ha, what is the history of this thing?" Was to go through the archives and tell them so that it remained kind of internally consistent. Mm. They keep having people like that, and the, those people keep leaving at mm -hmm. Wizards. Oh well. Next question. JC asks, "How has the Astratorium been handling the aftermath of the Phyrexian invasion?" Oh, this isn't canon. Um, I assume I, that I want to say that they just ticked on and didn't even notice. Yeah, yeah. like they were like, "No, no, back of the line, back of the line. No, no cutting in line." Oh right? no, we're used to yeah. this. Yeah, you to get a Phyrexian out. dreadnought, and she's like, "Oh." They, oh, oh. Yeah, they showed up and then Myra had them ejected for not paying, and that yeah. was the end of that. Yeah, I can't, I can't see, I can't see the Phyrexians making much headway into the Astratorium. No, not I with mean, their legions of well-paid and motivated workers. If they yeah. could, if they could find it, I mean, you know, like Nebula is not a particularly good driver. But that's true. Yeah, I do. I love the head cannon of they. They show up, they crash land, and they are immediately escorted out for non-payment. Yeah. Either that or the people who they cut in, who, who thought they were cutting in line ahead of. The people in line who the Phyrexians cut in line ahead of just murdered them. <laughs> yep. I the Phyrexians cut in line, but they went on that roller coaster that kills you, and that yeah. was the end of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They got flung into the black hole. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. The roller coaster. Has that anyone kills heard you. from the Phyrexian invasion force in, in, in Universe 2? No? no? Weird. No. Okay. Yeah, it's like. Hmm. Either that or they just had a great time. Yeah, whatever whatever like magical transformation field exists around Universe 2, uh, that they came in and they were just like, you know, like cartoony Phyrexians and then they got like the Icker cotton candy and went on some rides and like uh, came back with like souvenirs and t-shirts and then they like they crossed back through the portal and then suddenly they're like wearing t-shirts and holding things. Yeah. And they're like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> Elish actually... Norn is like what what are curly fries? Why are you telling me about this? Yeah. What I think is possibly a more interesting question is because in uh on whatever you know, you called it uh the you know, like the universe, it I, within the world of the Astratorium, uh the magic intellectual property exists. Mm -hmm. Right? Like people have like Oh, that's true. People have, you know, costumes and merchandise of the various magic things. So did did the Phyrexian invasion also happen within the magic uh, fiction in the world of the Astratorium to the extent that, like, you know, there's, like, hand puppets of Realmbreaker arms being like, oh, I'm going to come invade you, you know, like, yeah. is there... Oh, yeah, probably. You know. They got the... mistaken for walk-around characters and were mobbed to death by, like, excited children. <laughs> yeah, and meanwhile you have, like... I don't know, Phyrexians looking at a plush germ that isn't very well made and thinking, well, this is in kind of poor taste. Yeah. Right? <laughs> this place is canceled. This is appropriation. Yeah. Oh, man. I'm deeply uncomfortable here. That's, that's terrific. All right, next question. From Goose, does bread still apply to limited? Well, that's I don't think... bombs, removal, evasion... evasion. Ability? A yeah, Abilities ability and... and dregs i don't know defenders i don't know no i don't think it has for many years no but yeah. i mean like here's the deal like the people are like, like the, the every set is different yeah. and the priorities in every set are different however i don't think it's unreasonable to say that taking powerful cards mm -hmm. is a good strategy so to a certain extent bombs are always good mm -hmm. yeah Right, and but like, the same, but the, but like removal really wildly varies in quality and effectiveness from set to set. Like for mm -hmm. example, we just saw in Ixalan, there's so many good one drop creatures, and so if you're trading like removal for a one drop that's wrecking your day, you're behind on resources and mana because it's not one drop removal, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The I mean, even gosh, I don't even know how many years ago it is at this point. Probably like seven years ago now. Um, limited resources sort of canonized uh, cabs 
or oh. cards that affect the board state mm-hmm. as a replacement for bread. That it's not it's not specifically about following those things. It's just, you know, doing things that this is in limited, doing things that affect the board. You can't be spending six mana for a red enchantment that that you just cast it and it doesn't do anything the turn you know, that it might do something later if you cast, you know, what it, you can't just spend six mana on a do nothing enchantment, for example. That's not affecting the board. It's not doing anything. So creatures affect the board because you're putting a creature on the board. Removal affects it because you're removing their creatures, right? Mm-hmm. And sort of thinking it in that in that realm. And then further from also from limited resources is the 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 quadrant theory of mm-hmm. looking at cards um of what space in the game that you are in, right? Like, is this card good in the on like the first turn of the game? Is this card good when I'm behind? Is this card good when my opponent and I are at parity? Is this card good when I'm ahead? Right? Most you know? cards are good when you're ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, but there's some cards like is this card only good when you're ahead? Yes. Yes. Lots then of it's, cards are then only it's like, good when you're then ahead. Then that's a not a good thing to necessarily have because yeah. how often are you going to be ahead? So. Yeah. I mean, like, I think that all of these really approximate the uh, the true form of the, the thing, which is that it's important to have a strategy. Yes. And then to be able to execute it and take the cards that advance that strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Ta- so you see a powerful card that's black and you go okay i might be in black and now i'm going to try to choose impactful cards that work with whatever strategy this this powerful black card is suggesting like maybe it synergizes well with green right Mm -hmm. or cards that are also sharing a color it's like oh this is a good creature and hey this is some average removal i would take the creatures before i take the removal for sure so I, i had something scratching around in the back of my head and um there's a I thought there was an article, maybe it was a Star City article, but I did find a Reddit thread from 10 years ago <laughs> entitled Bread is Dead. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was around Theros. Discussing yeah, that, that's, that, yeah, that seems reasonable, right? Yeah. Like it, it's not wrong, but I think it fails to account for a lot of situations, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, the magic sets are not so homogenous and simplistic that you can just go down and make a pick order of like, these are like the best cards yeah, well, to you, take. Yeah, because you can't just say like, Bombs. Oh yeah, take bombs. What's bombs? Are are all mythics bombs? No. No. Some right? of them are only good in commander. So you need to have the other you need to have other What's a bomb in this format? Yeah, you need yeah. to you need to apply other heuristics to decide what a bomb is. Like in um to, I mean I've just I'm more familiar with Ixalan than what murders at Karloff Manor. Like um Kiln. Kiln was so good in that format. Oh hit the bricks. Yeah, hit, yeah, the, hit bricks. the bricks. Yeah, yeah. clay fired bricks is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Cosmic kiln is what it flips into, right? Yeah, co- cosmium kiln. Cosmium kiln. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, that's mm. an uncommon. Yeah. But like, I would take that over many rares in that set. Oh, yeah. Right? So like, that's what we mean by like, bombs or good, powerful cards. But like, that card affects the board Get and all Get yourself some Miner's Guide Wings and some Merfolk Siren. One of the best drafts we've ever done on, on, the, on the Thursday afternoon arena stream was it was like, Miner's Guide Wings and Merfolk Sirens. It was just one drop flyers. It was basically just a flying men deck. Nice. Uh, and then- nice. Just that's so good though. There's too much value. Yeah. And you had a kiln or a bricks, oh, yeah. and you just like, mm-hmm. yeah, get a uh, here, bird, hold this hammer, hit yeah. them. A, a yeah. primer, a prime example of why removal is bad because you spend three mana to kill Graham's one mana thing, and he puts the hammer on something else. Yeah, mm. there you go. Next question from Pharmacist Judge What's up? You are allowed to be on the creative text team of a Universes Beyond product. Which one? It can be an existing one, one that you wish can happen, or to revisit one that was done before. Discworld. Discworld. Hmm. Sorry, I've, we've answered. Not that question. We answered the question of like, what's a, uh, what's like a Universes Beyond you'd like to see? Hmm. And we answered Discworld. Also, that's one I would just like to be involved in the creative team for. Yes. Yeah. Me I too. mean, like, Warhammer 40k, I guess, would be my universe's. Oh yeah, I'd love to see you on that team. um, Yeah, because like we did, we did the Imperium, we did Chaos, we did Bugs, and we did Necrons. Yeah, still like Orcs, Eldar, Tau. Mm Hmm. More Imperials, because you always have to have more Imperials, I guess. I I I would hope. I, from my understanding, that was very successful, and I would hope that they're considering doing another four decks at some point. The 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 one problem with that is that Games Workshop is notoriously extremely picky about like um, how their IP is represented, mm-hmm. right? Like they are very very. They, it's a 
it's a tight leash. I know that on, on that. Um, so that's why when sorry earlier, Kathleen, when you were like, yeah, do what Games Workshop does. That's why I was like, in this instance, mm. yeah, because like the uh, uh, the I don't know what they call it, but like the network or whatever that they put together. Oh yeah, Warhammer Plus. Yeah, imagine if Wizards of the Coast was like, hey, people are doing a bunch of great video stuff about um about uh magic the gathering so we're we wizards of the coast are going to hire the command zone and loading ready run and prof and ristic studies to make stuff for us on a premium platform that you have to subscribe to also nobody else is allowed yep can you imagine the absolute (laughs) S storm. No. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, it was real bad. A, a, a critically terrible business decision from my perspective, but I don't work there. Yeah. No. It was, it, it, yeah. Anyway. Next question. Next question. Uh, from Neil, has MTG reached a word density where you spend more time reading the text than you spend resolving the effect? I mean, yeah. They're cool and sweet and such, but do the fine LRR folk yearn for the days of less game text and more flavor text? Well, like, I mean, the, 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 I, I suppose I could call up like any number of exceptions. Right? Yeah. Like Gaia's Library. Yeah. Um, Chains of Mephistopheles. <laughs> right? These are cards that... Classics. Like, yeah. Oubliette. Ooh. <laughs> right? Like... Th- um, Wizards has gotten very good at like writing rules text. Yeah, and I think maybe it gets away from them a little bit sometimes, where they have gotten like so concise and efficient at writing it, and they now know how to structure an effect that will produce or structure text in a way to produce the effect that they want and only the effect that they want, with some exceptions. Um. That they kind of like put four or five of those on some cards. Yeah. And it's, it's, and it's just, there's also instances where the card is designed to do a thing that is atypical for the, for what a card does. And so the only, be, because magic, and I love this about magic, because the rules text is so carefully worded and specific that like the, the words matter, right? That it's like it, it, the, the the way that they're arranged and what what words are used is very particular that to get the card to do the specific thing that they've designed it to do takes a lot of words hmm. you know and uh i can't remember what that thing was it was a, like a month or two ago where i was like oh this is limited so you can ignore the second paragraph or something and it was like <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's a wild thing to say where it's just like you can ignore that paragraph of this card um, I mean, obviously, I I love flavor text. I'm I I still wish there was a better solution for it on Arena because the only cards that inherently show their flavor text is vanilla creatures, which mm. we don't have anymore. Um, otherwise, you have to like look at the card. Like you have to, if you're looking at a face down card, um, you can't see. Normally, you have like the little pop out to the side will show the abilities of the card and then the flavor text. They don't do that with the face down cards. You have to right click on it and then say view printed card and then it will show you the flavor text because it's part of like the adjunct information. Mm-hmm. And like that's a shame because it just makes it so that when you're playing with these cards on Arena, you basically never see the flavor text unless you intentionally look for it, which is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. From again, from my see my world building complaint earlier. Um, I mean, the question was like, does it does it take you longer to read it than it does to resolve? Yeah, there's lots of cards like that. Um, I think it's general. I, th- I think we're generally doing okay, though. Honestly, yeah. Like, yeah, there are there are cards like we uh, we you know we joke about questing beast just because it has a bunch of different keyword abilities and then two different abilities that are a little niche that you have to remind yourself of, and it's like, yeah, keep reading questing beast, but. There have been cards printed since then that are definitely more complicated. I think it's more just like Questing Beast being, it was like a 4-4-4-4 four, 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 four with like lifelink, death touch, and... Not lifelink. Menace, trample. trample, and death touch? Not menace. It was. It, it had the thing where you 
can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. Yeah. But yeah, this is the example. Okay, but right? like here's the but the thing is you would think vigilance, death touch, and haste. Haste. Honestly, four four for four, stop reading after vigilance, death touch, and haste. Everything else is probably a drawback, right? And I think that your brain shortcuts that it has three abilities together. And then it, mm-hmm. I haven't turned to look yet. I think James brought it up on screen. He did. But it also when you <laughs> deals damage to a player, it also deals that much damage to a planeswalker they control. Why? Yeah, right? Yeah, and co- and combat damage that we dealt by creatures you control can't be prevented. They can't yeah. fog it. Oh, I, I forgot about that one. I completely forgot about that ability. See? I was like, it's oh, because no. because this card does uh, <laughs> six things. I was like, no, nah, I've nailed Questing Beast. I, re- I remembered Vigilance, Death, Such, Haste, and it can't be blocked by creatures by small creatures, and I remembered the Planeswalker one. Totally forgot about the damage can't be prevented. Okay, Questing Beast is a bad example. <laughs> This card's silly. Honestly, I think the the thing isn't um, the n- amount of rules text on a card that trips me up. It is the micro variations in largely similar rules text yes. that always gets me. Yes. I play aristocrats. I always forget what the different blood artists do. Because mm-hmm. there's like eight different blood artists that sometimes like... Is this just a creature that I control? Is it a creature anyone controls? Is it a permanent? Like, which one like, of my blood artists triggers when I crack a fetch land? Like, original three-mana Judith. Does Judith count tokens? Does Judith no. count herself? Yes. yes. I think. Yes. I think that's the case. But it's stuff like that, yeah. right? It's like, well, no, hang on. This one, is, hold up, right? I, I remember when we were doing the the the... The most complicated off-camera, it looked fine in the edit, the most complicated episode of Elder Dragon Social Club that we've done was the Doctor Who decks. Yes. Because mm. there was um, Ben's deck, especially, the the the, the, the 13th Doctor, I think. Um, there was like, there was cards that it's like, this cares about if you're casting a spell from exile. This other thing just cares about spells being cast. This other one is spells... Uh, there was like spells from a graveyard. No, like there was, it was just, there were so many different things to track that, like you said, were like slightly different. And it's like, oh, does this do that? No, that, because that's this thing. Okay. But this does, this does do that other thing. Uh, and then that thing cares. Like it was so many little dials and knobs and it was like, Mm -hmm. oh, it's, it's, there's so much involved here. I imagine a lot of stuff gets missed in uh, casual games, which is fine. It doesn't you miss whatever you like in a casual game. That's that's just that's just part of playing Magic. We just can't mess it up when there's thousands of people watching and correcting us. Hmm. I don't know if that was an answer to your question, but that's the answer you got. Next, I just do want to quickly point out that the question uh, asking about word density was the most wordy of all ten questions yep. I selected. Yep. Uh, so congratulations, I, Neil. I appreciate job, you. Neil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do we got next? From Potato Aim, do you guys feel it is easier to get into Magic now or when you started playing? Personally, I feel like it's more difficult now due to the lack of intro decks and a push from 1v1 to four-player commander games. Ooh. Like I, I don't know because I am not new to Magic. I, I mean... I assume that someone at WotC has done the numbers and realized that like Commander makes for a effective introduction to the game in yeah. that a lot of people will just hand a friend a Commander deck that they've already brewed and sit them down at a pod. Yeah. And Don't worry, I'll help you. Yeah. Uh, and I personally think Commander is an especially bad introduction to the game because it's, it's awful. extraordinarily complex. Yeah. Like even casual Commander games have can have quite a lot of mental load. Um, and I think that's honestly why a lot of Commander decks tend towards um, pretty like linear strategies. Mm-hmm. Um, just because there's so much to keep track of in a multiplayer game. Uh but like it, it seemed like people seem a lot more people seem to be playing magic than used to. So I right? guess Commander's a good way to get into it. I, I guess like it, it definitely posts numbers or mm-hmm. seems to be posting enough numbers that it is how people want their friends to play magic with them. And they did make you know you mentioned the, the no intro decks, which is true, but they did make those intro Commander decks, which were a great product. Um, and there's so, a lot know. of like introductory content to magic on Arena. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Which is a way to learn, right? Uh, what I like about Arena, same reason that for years we would recommend that people check out Duels the Planeswalkers, is that it'll teach you how the phases work and when you can respond to stuff. Uh, and you can sort of like mentally onboard that in a useful way. Hmm. So, uh, I don't know. Is it easier? Maybe because there's more people playing now. Maybe it's easier now for that reason. But unfortunately, we're not getting into magic right now, so I don't really know. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Our our perspective is warped. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's easier to get into magic now just because there are more people playing and it is a more accessible, like physically accessible uh, space to get into, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't don't know. LGSs feel more accessible to me than they did when I first started playing, when they were... Like, if you feel they're exclusive now, mm. <laughs> yeah. Like, there yeah. there were some there there was profound gatekeeping in the nineties, um, but that's probably like a whole other can of worms that yeah. require a lot of discussion and actual like citations. Um, <laughs> it felt it felt more hostile to get into when I was a little kid. Yeah. Um, and now I don't know. It seems kind of like vaguely mainstream or like cresting the mainstream people out there will know magic the gathering is something other than a punchline to a joke yeah yeah and i think that helps a lot yeah we got time for probably one or two more what you got james from jd poner as mtg players do you see what other card games are doing in terms of product design and wish magic had something similar I don't really evaluate other card games in terms of product design. I don't think, like, I assume that, from my experience, most other games seem to be looking at what Magic's doing and trying to adapt that to be legally distinct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, like, what what I see a lot of other card games doing is trying to solve the mana problem. Yep. Um, and that's the one thing that Magic can't really do do a lot of like that they had the flip cards in the zendikar set yep. yeah that were right. lands or spells yeah and i think that's probably the best implementation of the mechanic many other card games use which is you can just like play uh, you just have a, a growing pool of energy every turn it's yeah. like yeah. the hearthstone yeah like you solution. look at lorcana and like yeah the majority of the cards in lorcana can be just played face down as as a Land. As an energy, a, a energy source, a yeah. resource, whatever it is. Um, conversely, Lorcana at PAX Unplugged was doing that thing where uh, if you go to the Lorcana, the Ravensburger booth, and you spend 30 bucks on whatever, then you get uh, an exclusive card. And uh, years ago, Magic learned that that was a bad idea because people don't like it when it's like, yeah, here's a card you can only get at this convention. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, hmm, I wonder how much longer. But the thing is, but... Again, Ravensburger has a very different um, uh, policy around like reprinting stuff. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it'll be a lot easier for players to get those cards. I I imagine that mm-hmm. it's it, it's not the same sort of thing where because uh, I my understanding is that Ravensburger is looking at Lorcana in the same way that the Pokemon Company is looking at the Pokemon card game, which is like, oh, it's sold out. Well, heck, print more. Yeah. Rather than like. Oh, it's sold out? Excellent. Well, it's done. <laughs> yeah. We're not doing more. more. We got new cards coming, right? Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, Product design. No, I'm not. Yeah, I agree with I, I agree with Kathleen. I think it's mostly that there's other games just looking to magic and being like, well, what do they do? They're the most successful one ever. Mm-hmm. They, 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 you know, they rose from the, the, the bloody battlefield of the, of the nineties, you know, holding high the heads of like legend of the five rings and the, the star Wars and star Trek CCGs and like all the, yeah. I, uh, I can't remember uh net runner even like, you know, it's magic one, <laughs> like magic survived and is yeah. still doing amazingly in the face yeah, of the, all the other, there ones. was an extinction event and now everything is going to be a descendant of magic. <laughs> that's a, wow. That's an yes, that's exactly right. It. Damn. Yeah. That's that's profound. Those were the genes that survived. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's going to be I think it's going I think it's difficult for card game designers now to not approach the design of a card game not as magic. Mhm. 
it's just I I think it's kind of like dominant in the headspace. Yeah. Uh, and that's the last one. Nice. Is that correct, James? Yes. Oh. Oh, hey, Paul. Oh, no. Wow. <laughs> it's Paul now. It's we've we. It's gone so long that James turned into Paul. When does that happen? What's the what's the mitigating? Uh, is it like a time based thing or? Like, does the potion wear off, or <laughs> it's kind of a yeah, it's sort of a timeshare operation. Okay. Cool, yeah. cool. All right, well, hey, that's that's going to do it for uh, Tap Tap Concede for today. Thanks everybody for your questions. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions, but there was a lot of questions, and those were good questions, and hopefully you enjoyed the discussions. Um, a reminder that this show is brought to you by Card Kingdom. Please check out cardkingdom.com/lrr. And, of course, it is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun. Thank you. I've been Graham, joined by Cameron hmm? and Kathleen. Ah. James was on tech, but now Paul is on tech. <gasps> Heather gets these online. Thank you all so much for watching and listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.